Hello. We're going to talk today about multiculturalism, school reform, and the marginalization of students. I think multiculturalism and really what is diversity is something that is not understood by most people. It is it's something that's necessary. And to begin with, I'm going to just go over a quote that really stuck out to me on Nieto and I think sums up this whole unit. And that is, a major problem with the monocultural curriculum is that it gives students only one way of seeing the word. When reality is presented as static, finished, and flat, the underlying tensions, controversies, passions, and problems faced by people throughout history and today appear, disappear. To be informed and active participants in a democratic society, students need to understand the complexity of the world and the many perspectives involved. Using a critical perspective, students learn that there is not just one way or even two or three of viewing issues. So we're going to talk about seven different aspects. I'm going to combine some and we'll not go into others in detail just due to time. But a multicultural education is anti-racist. It is a basic part of education. It is important for all students. It is pervasive. It is for social justice. It's a process and it is critical pedagogy. So to begin with, multiculturalism is anti-racist. And many people, when they hear this, they're very quick to say, oh, I'm not racist. And uh, I think the majority of these people are not. But there's tr triggers, there's subtle signals that we can easily send that will be interpreted as racist. And unfortunately, this can happen in education as well. I think about yesterday, my son and I went into a restaurant to pick up some food, and I saw a young man come out with a shirt that said, here's my diversity for you. And on the shirt, it had uh, several handguns, an AR-74, a SKS, and I'm looking at this thing, well, what signal did you just send about um, diversity about multiculturalism and even though he could easily not have a racist bone in his body that shirt would still be something that is offensive just due to the message it's sending so we must be careful though when we're going into multiculturalism and anti-racist we can't turn into an us versus them and this is typically done by the dominant power group. But it can't be, we did this, they did that. We did this, that group did this. Nor can we just be talking about the superficial aspects. An example I'm thinking about now at the school I'm working at is they're talking about an African American who was famous in history each day. And that's not a bad thing. That, that's a good thing. But the only problem is once March 1st comes around, that's it. And for some of these teachers, for some of these students, that might be the only time that African-American culture uh, accomplishments ever got mentioned. And it has to be more integrated into that. In addition, it's got to acknowledge the unpleasant parts. History and you're going to hear me say this again and again, it's a dirty thing. It's a messy thing. I always joke to my students, if you want to study history, you're going to need Prozac because it's depressing, but we've got to acknowledge that. Just like the first step of any 12-step um, any program is to acknowledge there's a problem, that there is a problem, and we cannot move past it until we acknowledge the unpleasantness and realize that it's still with us today. It's also got to be balanced. And balance does not mean singling things out or necessarily bringing attention to it. For example, um, I, I think of an American history textbook where it had women accomplishments. And then it had Native American accomplishments. And that's not the correct way to teach. It's not, look at all the things that these people did, and oh yes, yes, let's throw in somebody in there. 
In addition, that's not the way history happened. It wasn't settlers doing all one thing in their area <coughs> and Native Americans in another and women in a third and they never met. It's all integrated. It's also got to be important for all students. We're not giving multiculturalism because we have this population or because this population is not aware. That's a very false way and it's not going to be effective. It needs to be inclusive in the material and in the audience. Young people from dominant groups are very prone to develop an unrealistic view of the world. They don't understand the way the world works or the way, uh, let me rephrase that, the way that other people see and may live the world. And a lot of it's just through innocent. We need to educate our students what a multi multicultural society is living like what the rest of the world lives like and outside of their neighborhood, their block, their home. And a multicultural education is going to be a rich education. It's an ongoing education. So it's going to be pervasive. And if you're going to read one part in this book, well, at least this chapter, then I would say this is the part you need to read, page 75. It permeates the entire school. It is in the curriculum. It is in the letters home. It is in the um, the meet the parent aspects. It is in the textbooks. It is in the teachers. It is in the student-led activities. It is in the principals. It is in everything. If you just have it in one aspect, then you're not buying into it, and it's people are going to fall back to the status quo. It's an educational philosophy. And it's really a necessary philosophy. It's also a way to promote social justice. We always, at least I did, um, and I still think this, although I tell my kids the same thing, uh, that life's not fair. And, of course, we all want life to be fair. Well, that's the wonderful thing of being a teacher, of being an educator. We can, at least in our niche, make it fair. We can teach other human beings how to make life there and I, I don't know about you but when I think about that when I hear it, it just gets me fired up because what a power we have that we can make our classroom our school a multicultural world and from there they can go off and make the world multicultural one way we can better do this is by reflecting on our actions I remember I did this for my teacher certification, but even, and I kind of stopped. But still, every once in a while, I like to do a full-out lesson plan. I like to look back, what did I do this week? And if you don't reflect, you cannot make a change. You're not going to be able to spread multicultural education. It's a process, and it is critical. Multicultural education is always changing. We have different groups of immigrants uh, coming in the nation. Uh, I know I heard today on NPR while taking my daughter to hockey practice that the irony is in politics they're talking about Latino immigration when the majority of it is coming from East Asia. It's changing. It's going to change. And even the fact that, um, as we read in the Piper book, that once groups come here, then they're changing because how do they interact with American society, with the different cultures? We must acknowledge this and we've got to integrate this into our curriculum. We also must be sensitive. These different cultural groups, whether it's the dominant group, the uh, subcultural groups, everybody, they are human beings and we've got to work with them. We've got to work for them and acknowledge that some of them are going through some very hard things and it may not be the ones you always think it is but if we acknowledge them as individuals then we can encourage the process of multicultural education and it's critical we all know that you do not teach to the lowest denominator hopefully you've all seen the studies where you teach low you get low results you teach high you get high results and life is not black and white. 
education is not black and white. I know when I know when I was in school, I was taught about the American Constitution, and it was almost as though it descended from heaven into Independence Hall to our founding father's hands. And if you've ever read our founding father's documents, pretty much the exact opposite happened. They did not like it. It was a messy affair. And understanding that, you can understand the way the real world works. And it's a shame that, unfortunately, this is how we still teach. Uh, my daughter came home from school in first grade and is still has the same idea, but we can't promote this black and white. Life is not black and white. There's multiple viewpoints. There's six or seven, and there's not always one right way to do things. I'm going to move on to the other article, and now that we know how multicultural education works, how are students marginalized? And the United States is becoming a minority majority nation. There is no larger group, and you are going to have a diverse classroom. This is most likely going to be the rule, not the exception. And we have to acknowledge that. We can't stick our heads in the stand saying, nor should we want to. You can't teach as we taught 10 years ago, God forbid, 30 years ago. To begin with, we need to acknowledge what a culture is. And a culture is a group of common beliefs, including shared traditions, languages, styles, values, agreements about norms for living. <clears throat> there is a dominant culture, although many Americans may say, well, we don't have a culture. And in fact, these cultures might be in conflict with the main American group. Anybody who's gone from Texas to New York will know that there are two different cultures, or let's say from London to Yorkshire. There's also subcultures. There's interracial, intercultural, uh, and these individual differences exist, and sometimes they may even conflict with each other. We also need to acknowledge with the internet that it's really tying the world together that there's some subcultures that may exist that our students are coming up part of or identifying with that we can't even imagine and we don't know of, and we have to include that as well. When a lot of people think of culture, they then go to race. Race is not a genetic thing. There is no gene. I can't make a gene and bada bing, I got somebody from Africa and bada boom, I've got somebody from East Asia. It doesn't work like that. It's a social construct that, and I'm sorry to use the word in the definition, but it was used really to oppress and further racism. Um, to let me let me show the next si slide to kind of show what I'm talking about in a second, but um, you can't. It, it's something that exists socially and not physically. Rather, there is ethnicity, which is based on a natural and cultural group. But again, this is not physical characteristics. It's who they identify with. Um, these are my children, and like any good father, I have to throw them in. But I'm also throwing them in for a reason. Um, racially, they're considered white. Uh, at least that's what they have on their birth certificate. But at the same time, my family ethnically is, even though it's Scottish and Polish American, I identify as a Polish American. I don't have any um, ties to my Scottish American family because I was mainly raised by my Polish American mother. My wife is Peruvian, but uh, ethnically, her parents, her mother was actually an immigrant from uh, Brazil, she's an African and Brazilian, and her father is from a Native American tribe in uh, La Selva in Peru. And under how we often define race, then, well, shoot, under the one drop rule, they could be African American, they could be Native American, and at the same time, if you ask my, me or my wife, race is not an issue and ethnically even though yes there's those um, th there's those aspects she wouldn't identify with the um, Native American culture she would not identify with the Afro-Brazilian culture she considers herself Peruvian and nothing else at the same time, race does still exist as a social construct, and we've got to acknowledge that. Um, it's increasingly becoming 
less and less of something you can defend with migration, interracial pairings, but it does exist, and there is a history of oppression, and there is still oppression going on, and we've got to acknowledge that socially, how this can marginalize our students. There's also social class, or often referred to as SES group, and these do exist, they do affect education. Most Americans like to say, well, there is no social class, and that's not true. Uh, a lot of Americans do try to dress or act like the wealthy. That's what, uh, just throwing out there as an economic teacher, read uh, The Millionaire Next Door to see uh, a little more about this. But getting back to that, that does not necessarily mean anything of the SES group where our students are coming from. And they can be affected with their housing, basic necessities, and family reinforcement. And the U.S. is a very unequal society when it comes to income, but because we do judge people by their uh, status, by their appearance, that it can often fool us. Thus, you can't say, well, Johnny could have done this work because he has a $600 iPhone. Well, that's not acknowledging the realities of SES groups and how it works, the background, and you're really not empowering the student. That's not a comment that's going to lead you anywhere. And to also acknowledge that this affects students in all aspects, from the very low to the very high. There's sex and gender distinctions. We must be careful not to pigeonhole students, um, not to encourage them. Just think of what am I telling my students if I need the strongest boys to come and lift this for me? Well, what, what message did I just send to my boys who are not athletic or to 50% of the class who is female? And we need to encourage individuals as they are, not as we expect them to or as um, a sexist society can. We also need to acknowledge and be aware that many of our students are going to uh, identify with being gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, and they're denied rights, they're denied opportunities, and in fact, uh, I don't have the exact statistic, but if I'm not mistaken, the highest suicide rate among teenagers does come from LGBT uh, young people. And we need to acknowledge not only the personal struggle that these students are facing in a society, but how are they being treated by the learning community, by their fellow students, and we need to make a learning environment that is not going to marginalize or discriminate against them just because of society's biases. We need to encourage their learning opportunities and incorporate these students as well. So to end with, multicultural education is a good education. It's analytical and reflective. We need to empower and marginalize students. I hope, I, I know I was not able to cover everything in detail, and I apologize about that, but I hope this was able to give you at least a good analysis. If you have any questions or comments, please leave this in the discussion board underneath, and I hope to answer them. And I look forward to participating in all of your discussions. Have a good week.